The last but not least uh, subject, which is that of fluctuations. Fluctuations are intrinsically large in small systems. To illustrate this, let's look at the errors that come about from sampling a system. And so if you're counting events that are occurring, um, there's either, a, for example, a, a head or a tail if you're flipping pennies or something, and you're asking, have I sampled the probability uh, you know, well enough? What's the chance that I end up with my expected probability of a half? Counting errors in small systems um, obey, well, actually, in all systems, but the counting errors, sampling errors, uh, follow for at least a reasonable number of counts, a distribution that looks like the so-called normal distribution. So here's the expected mean of the distribution. And here's the frequency with which you make an observation. This spread in the distribution here is uh, given from the fact that the variance sigma is equal to the mean for a Poisson distribution. Although this is just true for a Poisson distribution, almost all random uh, systems with large enough counts and independent variables follow a distribution like that. This is the uh, central limit theorem. But to take the example of the Poisson distribution, supposing I have a system of n atoms or molecules, and each has some intrinsic energy epsilon, then the average energy of that system, of course, is just n epsilon. And that is the mean mu in this distribution. But the, uh, this result here says that the likely fluctuations in that, one standard deviation away from the mean, are given by this variance here, which is just the mean. So the fluctuations then go like the square root of n. So the relative scale of fluctuations relative to the size of the system, so this would be the fluctuations in energy if I multiply by epsilon, the relative size of the fluctuations in energy would look like this. So you see then in a system of many particles, the fluctuations go to zero. But in a system of a few particles, they become significant. So for example, if I had nine particles, the relative fluctuations in the, in the energy of a system of nine particles would be one over the square root of nine or three. Uh, it would be 30% of fluctuation likely in a system like that. And this is one of the single most significant aspects of nanoscience and indeed the driving uh, phenomenon um, in biology and chemistry. So many new things happen when a system has very large fluctuations in it. That's not all that's required though for new science. So let's uh, go on to talk about emergent phenomena. So we've seen already that the relative fluctuations in a system of n atoms uh, look like the square root of the number of atoms divided by the number of atoms. But as the system gets larger, the complexity, or the number of possible ways we can arrange the system, looks something like, for example, if there are different individual particles, the factorial of the number of particles. And we can write this, uh, at least in a hand-waving way, using Stirling's formula.
To say then that which is on the order of So the number of possible arrangements of a system goes up exponentially with the number of particles in it, whereas the fluctuations decrease like the square root of n over n. So what this graph is showing you here is on one axis the relative fluctuations and on the second axis the growth in complexity. So you see there is a sort of sweet spot in which a system still has a large relative fluctuation, let's say, in the available energy, but also for that given size of fluctuation, a large number of possible arrangements. Now it turns out that if you look at um, a problem on the energy scale of electron transfer in uh, chemistry, the N that matters is something like 100 to a thousand atoms or molecules. Now when the system is uh, both fluctuating enough but also uh, complex enough, very rare configurations of the system can cause new things to happen. Now this sounds exotic, but let's just consider a simple chemical reaction. What this graph shows is a plot of the energy of a system versus some coordinate that measures the progress of a reaction. So here in this first energy minimum are the reactants in a reaction and over here in this deeper minimum are the products of the reaction. For example, now even although water has a lower energy than a mixture of hydrogen and oxygen, you know that hydrogen will exist perfectly stably in oxygen as long as one doesn't light a match. So what's happening here? Well, the fact is that a hydrogen molecule is a stable structure and an oxygen molecule is a stable structure. To form a water molecule, they have to distort into a high energy configuration such that the two molecules now begin to resemble some precursor of water. And since these were both in their local equilibrium configuration, it takes energy to do this. So in fact, in a mixture of hydrogen and oxygen, you have to light a match. And then there is a loud bang, and this distorted form here then emits a lot of heat and produces water. This magic point here is called the transition state. And it took a lot of energy to get to it because it was a highly distorted, unusual state of the system. This is a simple chemical reaction, <clears throat> but you'll see that in uh, biology, for example, chemical reactions are used to make fluctuations go on average in a particular direction in the operation of molecular motors. And you'll see a diagram very much like this one here, in which once a set of proteins fluctuate nearly all the way around a turn of a motor, the binding and release of an energy-giving molecule at this point helps drive the system over this hump and into another stable equilibrium configuration until fluctuations uh, drive the rotor in a biological motor again. Quite unlike the um, little uh, motor we saw from Alex Zettel's lab, uh, biological motors are completely dominated by fluctuations.